Another best of five, the losers match, everybody. In Group A, we have Warhead Junction as our starting map, and now Team Dequaza is going up against Team Gia. So, this is the losers match. Pretty simple. We are on the group stage. We have two groups with four teams each, and this is, as I said, the losers match. These teams already played, and whoever loses on the in the series is out. Is out of the tournament, and is gone. So... When we're talking about the Banshee Cup, once again, quick reminder, we have in total, thanks to Kevin, thanks to Psykiv, the uh, Heroes Esports Sugar Daddy, the man that has more for Heroes Esports than Blizzard themselves. Uh, we have, thanks to him, $2,500 as a prize pool here, and we split it into two parts. $1,500 goes to the top three teams, normal tournament prize pool, and then we have 1000 that goes to the Bounty Pool. So Bounty Pool, as we talked about in the past, teams can complete these bounties. This is all optional. We're not trying to push them into it. We're trying to give them a reward if they go for a risk. So it's a risk and reward calculation that they have to go for. And we have seen around seven bounties already completed. I think three of them by Team Ultra Lisk alone at this point. And they can do that. They don't have to. But we have a bounty pool of $1,000. And the more bounties you complete, the bigger a share you get from that bounty pool at the end of the tournament. Always depending on how many bounties were completed in total and how many bounties you as a team completed. So you get a share accordingly. Now, teams can pull it off. We might see it here in the group stage. Teams might say, hey, it's too risky. We don't want to risk uh, moving on to the finals. Time will tell. But we had some awesome games already uh, through the round robin, and yeah, it's been quite the blast. A lot of the bounties were attempted and failed, but we also had a lot completed. So now that we're heading into the first map of the best of five here between Team Dequaza and Team Gia, the question is, of course, who's going to take the win? Sylvanas early on already. And Warhead Junction is a map that I've said a thousand times centers around the top lane boss. You could argue that basically everything else is totally irrelevant and doesn't matter and that all that matters is that you get that top side boss at the second time. The first time it does damage but it usually doesn't win the game. The second time it very often ends the game and if it doesn't then the third one surely does. So if you have Sylvanas with this you can do even more damage. So a lot of it really hinges on whether or not you're winning that fight at the top lane for the boss or of course if you're winning a fight somewhere else on the map and then you move to the boss and claim it then. So yeah, massively important. You can always play around the warheads and use them for that fight or any kind of push that you set up afterwards with the boss to defend against it. But it is one of the most important features on this map for sure. Now we have Diablo, Hanzo and Brightwing on the side of Team Dequaza. I would have before the series told you that they're the clear favorite here. They ended fourth in the round robin stage. So when you looked at the standing at the end of the first phase of the tournament, they were fourth place and Team Gia was eighth place. So pretty clear on paper who's the favorite there. And they might win. But I've also seen how Team Gia played against Team Banana H who were first seed. And that series was bonkers, absolute bananas. If you haven't seen it yet, check it out on YouTube, because if you haven't watched that yet, you're missing out. That was a fantastic best of five, and you really couldn't tell that we had different seedings for these two teams, because they were at each other's throat the entire time. It was bonkers. So, I don't know what to expect from Team Gia. I really don't. So, on paper, they are the underdog. But if they play the on the same level that they played earlier ball. against Banana H and his team, then there is a chance that they are just absolutely crushing it. Time will tell. We get Anduin, we get the Haka. It's a big map, of course. Running a global is definitely worth it. And the final two picks for the red team with ETC on the side lane. And we get Drakia on Genji. So, final pick. Gia's coming in. And, yeah. Off we go. Gia is the final pick. That's going to be the one. Right now it is... What do they need? They need a little bit more damage. So, yeah. There we go. My F is the final choice. So we got Mirrodin, we got the Haka, and we got My F. Ladies and gentlemen, Warhead Junction, game number one in the best of five series. Let's go. Game number one in the best of five. And on the left, we got Gia with the blue team. Kotzel playing Mirrodin for them. We got Ritchu on the Haka. Savalosh on Anduin, Gia on Maev, and Skok on Sylvanas. On the right side of the map, Team Dequaza with the Captain on ETC, Madara on Hanzo. We have Gamerboy on Brightwing, Play on Diablo, and Drakir is playing Genji in the first game of the series. 
setting the pace a bit. That's kind of what we're expecting here. Kind of giving us a bit of an idea of what we can expect from the teams and uh, which team is taking the lead. So Sylvanas could play a massive role here. Gia is also, for one of the first times in a long time, able to play Maev. She was banned out consistently against him. At this time, they're able to claim her. And they're using Sylvanas right away to go for a tower, whereas Makotsl is just trying to slow down the rotation and also warn them about it. So they take the entire thing down. That's already a win. Taking a tower down in a situation like this is always big. So, yeah, job well done. Nicely played. And since that happens, the top lane is already under slight pressure with the boss, of course, spawning then at the five minute mark, so trying to use the tunnels to go down to the bottom of the map. ETC is already there, also getting in position for it. Has gone into the prog rock on level one as his weapon of choice. Yeah, and we can slowly start. Oh, top side also. Next attack is coming in. Yeah, they're already looking for another opportunity here to get a gank set up with Diablo charging in, I suppose and pinning a target down. Watchtower also kind of important. You want to make sure that you're having as much vision as you possibly can, so the teams are going to be fighting for this one a bit. And it's all about, all about the camps. Once after the one minute mark, you're going to start to go for a little bit of camp clear on these. So this is going to be the first thing. Try and get those onto the lane. Then then two minutes and 30, we're going to get the objective announced. And then of course, the first few warheads will likely be used to uh, burst some of the walls down. But the boss is still going to be heavily important, specifically the second one, as I already pointed out during the draft. Drag here also gets hit here, and uh, up to now everybody's just testing the waters a little bit. Nobody wants to go too deep on any of this just yet. Nobody wants to move too far out, get too aggressive, and then get punished for it. So they're just testing the waters a little bit to see what they can expect in the series. But with a nice play up at the top, where is of course my F. So Gia is going to be looking for some opportunities to get a proper tether through and set a kill up for the team. Mm, yeah, also level four talents now kicking in on both sides as they are starting to take that top side wall out. And again, top lane is heavily important. This is where the boss marches through. If you can take some of these structures out before bosses even claim, it's gonna make your potential push with it so much more effective. And that is what they're working for. Oof. And the Quasa is pausing the game. So I'm not sure if they lost anybody here. Doesn't really seem like it. The man himself at the bottom of the map. The rest of the team is sitting up at the top. But yeah, they're definitely taking some damage here. Tactical pause detected 100%. I mean, at this point, they are realizing they're losing ground on the top lane. They're immediately, okay, boys, we gotta, we gotta have a strategic discussion here of what's going on. So what are we actually doing with this? Um, yeah. Or, on the other hand, Madara just found out that we reserved the right to name his first child last week and is having some objections and some more questions about that. So, yeah, one of the two, whatever it is. Suffice it to say, I really like the attack at the top for the reason mentioned. The boss that we'll put, put down later is going to be mega important, is very likely going to end the game for one of the teams. If you can take any kind of structure out at the top side, you are going to be in a really nice spot. So, yeah. Obviously, at this point, still a bit of poke happening. Skork is getting attacked, and with the engage from Diablo, he gets killed. But they are getting Diablo as well. So that's a kill for a kill. Sylvanas being taken out means that at least the push is losing some of its momentum that we had from earlier today. So that's already a neat one. Now, we have the first few warheads on the map, and they're already being channeled as we speak. The Haka is now sitting over on the left side and is trying to get this one. Let's see how many uh, each team can claim here. But a bit of a lead already for Team Gia. So they're having a tiny lead. Gia himself with another channel right there. Top side, yep, there's the push. And there's of course now the chance to take this down a notch. I'm really a little bit surprised that Team Dequaza doesn't focus more onto the top lane. I really am. I would be shocked if the game ends on any other lane but the top lane. So... Yeah, this is a little bit of a weird one. Now, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this is going to be the exception to the games that we've seen so far in Warhead. It's not like the map is being played a ton uh, in tournaments. So we're putting in it in every now and then to shake things up a little bit. But up to now, I want to say every single time that we've seen this map picked, it was a top lane push with a boss with very few exceptions that really did the most work. So now ETC is using his own nuke at the top is making a move there. Skullcracker's in on level 7. 
and a few camps taken down at the bottom of the map, but yep, it's all one versus one now with the Haka going up against ETC. The pressure play at the bottom of the map continuing as well. And here we go. Another big hit. A little bit mistimed. Minion Wave wasn't quite in range yet, but still doing good damage. And they're setting another one up immediately. It's like, yeah, we got two of those. Let's go. And this one is hitting home hard. ETC still tries to come in with the slide, but Muradin already anticipated it and moves away very quickly. So yeah, job well done by him. We go for ETC, but Tiquaza is still sliding out here. But all in all, with Hanzo now getting killed, uh, adding, ooh, maybe even Diablo? Genji, he gets out, Diablo, and he's gone. He should be gone. He is gone. Three kills to one, and with Sylvanas, they're pushing this further. I really like the way that Team Gia is playing this currently, and this again highlights what I said during the draft. Their fourth seed, uh, sorry, their eighth seed means kind of nothing, because for some reason, they're absolutely crushing it. They've been doing so much better here than they did in any of the round robin matches. It's ridiculous. And now they've destroyed the fort at the bottom of the map, and let's not forget they did significant damage to the fort at the top lane too. So, Team Gia with momentum already here in game number one, early on. Level 10 abilities aren't there yet, so you always have to ask yourself, hey, how is this going to play out later on? Uh, are we going to see a team walk away with level 10 momentum and then just flip the table, turn things around completely? But at least right now, right now, it's the blue team. Blue team is making the choices, making the nice plays, and setting things up for later. Destroy is already uh, fought at the bottom, which means the fountain is gone. Easier access to the warheads, therefore. Boss is, by the way, up. So we have level 10 abilities that are kicking in on top of that as well. As they're still pushing for the top side forward, aiming to take it out. There's a minion wave, but this is going to get destroyed quickly. They were trying to make a play for the Haka. That didn't play out, so they didn't even get the kill, but they still lost the fort at the top. So, yeah. A little bit tricky. Actually, a lot tricky. So, ETC now with stage dive, as you would expect. And they're still pushing at the top a bit more. So, down to the bottom of the map. Dequaza with the channel. They're getting at least another nuke. But the boss is already being taken. They're starting to rotate over. This will always be a bit of a tough one. But the rotation is too late. They're not going to be there in time. Muradin is already saying hello. And the boss is about to be claimed. ETC with a stage dive, and... Oh, they stop it! They actually stopped it! Can they claim it? Can they steal it? It looks like it. Everybody's low on the blue team. They're losing one, they're losing two. Boss is taken. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you throw an advantage with both hands. <laughs> Not too bad. Yep, that's how you throw an advantage away. Right there. So... Big one, and that spells trouble for them. I mean, real trouble. So, with that, we now have the top side fort about to be dropped. We're having the, oh God, like seriously, they took a risk and it really backfired against them. If they take that boss, can you imagine how many damage they can do at the top lane with Sylvanas? But now it's three kills to three. And again, these bosses, they hurt. The first one, as I said before, very unlikely to end the game, but it's going to do damage. Took a fort out already, and they're opening up the wall here too. The second one, that's a very different story. So with all the work that has been done by Team Chia beforehand, the decision they made at the top backfired. And I'd say, I think it was, who was it actually that came onto the point? I think it was ETC getting out of the disc that stopped it for just a moment to allow the rest of the team to engage. So, stage dive might have just saved them that game there. Maybe I'm wrong and it was Diablo that was able to push through. Could also be a thing. But, yeah. That's still something. And Dibbles talking about him is already pushing around it again. Next attacks, they are for sure coming here. But, boy, oh boy. That backfired. <laughs> that backfired a lot. <laughs> And they're a bit behind in experience now. They lost the top side for it. So, yeah, I mean, it could be worse, right? Essentially, they are more... I mean, on the map, they're more or less even now. Bottom four. It's still a bit ahead in, the, in forts. It's more so a problem of what happened around everything else. So, yeah. But, okay. Let's see how they're playing this. I mean, right now, we're getting them with level 13 talents. The team is a little bit ahead here. We're still having Diablo pushing back out. Light bomb. 
That didn't do anything. Uh, Muradin gets hit by the arrow, but saved by Anduin. So teams are just exchanging a couple of ults in an attempt to uh, get to a decent point here. Yeah, and the red team is getting more and more aggressive now. Diablo already sitting up at the front here. Can I try and push that out once again. Down at the bottom of the map, yeah. Sylvanas is sitting tight, has to try and defend this. Divus is about to move in. And... Yeah, let's see how they can, can play this. Muradin has now his... Muradin has his synergy now. He has his level 4 and his level 13 lined up, so team fights are going to be a bit better for him. He's going to get the extra sustain that he was missing in some of those fights. That would have been very useful when he was trying to control the point at the top, so this is going to be really neat if they're ending up in that situation again. Trying to tether Diablo around. Nice! And there it is! A lot of terror on my ass. Weak Kitten is more like it. That guy is once again gone. So he's a bit of a joker. Not so terrifying right now. Four kills to three. My F goes forward again, gets pushed back, and they're already abandoning their position here. But now we're ten minutes into the game. Boss is back up in 140. And yeah, we're gonna get a couple more warheads that can of course be picked up here. But now it's definitely a game. Nice back and forth. Leading experience is again in the, in the hands of the blue team. The barbecue play, lightning breath, yep. The Tong missing. Yeah, he was hoping for Diablo to move to the top, so the blue team is still swarming this and hoping to get a kill and set something up, but they can't really. Murden rotating back slowly, same for the Haga. All ults have essentially been used. Mayev still has a disc ready, but besides that, nearly everybody went straight in for their R button. And ETC, of course, with the stage dive, still making their plays here. At the top, sitting on the side lane, pushing this out, can then jump back into the fight if he needs to. But he also gets some assistance from uh, Diablo right now, who's trying to go for the camp and help out with that. So, yeah, here we go. And the blue team wants to invade. This time they want to be the ones to invade. And they might be able to steal it. This maybe. They're definitely going for it. And Muradin again, he has his clap. He has healing, but then again, ETC controls the space, grabs the camp for them. Now they're in trouble, trying to rush away. They went for the risky play, and it is backfiring. Light Bomb doesn't even connect. They lost Murden. They lost Sylvanas. Uh, and the Haka is going to be dead as well in a second. He's trying to get at least a Warhead drop, but that didn't work out. The boss is up in 10. That could be game. That could be game. Again, most of the time it is the second boss that finishes the game. Now, it's taken very early. It's taken at the 12 minute mark. So I think they have a chance here, especially since the lane is pushed out because of this camp. There's no minion runes that are coming through just yet. So there's a chance that it goes to a third boss. But there is a chance that the game ends here. So yeah, they're taking it. I don't know, pushing with it, are they? Really? Oh, okay. Well, they got level 16. They don't want to push into this. Apparently, at least a little bit. Diablo is moving down to the bottom of the map. Ah, okay, he's tapping the fountain. Diablo was tapping the fountain. They didn't want to wait for Brightwing or anything. So he tapped the fountain. ETC obviously has a global. Okay, so they are pushing with it after all. They got also two nukes. Let's not forget about that. So yeah, this one is going to be big. This push is going to hurt. I think the, the keep falls 100%. It's just a question of whether or not they can go for, uh, for core. Was for a moment very confused there. But yeah, so there's the first one, already zoning them away with one nuke, not allowing them to even connect with that space. Keep again is 100% gone, but I don't, I'm don't. i not sure if the boss is strong enough. If they get a kill, then yeah, it's definitely lights out. So they're jumping in with ETC. That could be the slide. And Muradin low gets caught. Anduin saves him. And here's the attack with the double nuke executed by Team Gia to try and save the day. And I think they can. ETC is mega low, boss does some damage but not enough, so yeah, it's still a bit too early. Sylvanas is dead again though, and that might change things, especially if they can get another kill. They're already playing around Lightning Breath, eh, ho oh, oh, Merlin gets saved again. How many nukes do they have? Ah, <laughs> sorry, it's the core. <laughs> I really thought they had some nukes, I was just like sitting there, I was like, what's happening? But yeah, they're going for the core now too, and this one is getting hit hard. So it might be that the second boss takes it on after all. So yeah, nukes are coming down. This looks like the end, guys. They are in trouble, and the rule still holds. If you take the second boss, you are essentially winning the game. 
Genji is dead. They have the quad 40%. They're still trying. They got to right click the hell out of it, but they should be good here. Yep, the Quasa comes in, gets a bit of damage. Hanzo, ah, you don't, they, they, don't, they don't have it. They don't have it. Team, they don't have it. They don't have it. <laughs> it's 27%. 27% on the core. Yeah, if they had another nuke, they could have maybe taken it down. But Diablo is now going to die too. Diablo is going to die, and when he's running around and trying to get himself a nuke, Diablo is going to lose his soul stacks. The Chia survived. So, we've seen a couple of these games where the core was down at some point to... I don't know, even know how many points anymore. I think we had seven in one of the games. But, yep, there it is. So, nine kills, two, seven. And now they actually have some nukes. <laughs> oh, it was so funny. Like, I saw the nuke at the core and I was immediately like, Damn, they have a nuke! The Haka must have picked one up when he tunneled in. And then I was just like, but there were no... <laughs> the other half of my brain was like, but there was no nuke on the map, so how did he pick one up? And I was like, I must have missed it. And then when the second phase of the core came through, I was just like, wait a second. Those are not nukes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just too good. Yeah, yeah. Glorious. So, now they actually have some. They got three nukes. So now they have at least a few uh, toys. And boss is up again in a minute and 40. And this one hits hard. So, you could use those nukes to get the boss, for example. So, yep, that's the thing. Could do that. Damage output, we have 47,000 for Mayev. We're getting 58,000 for Hanzo. So yeah, he's top damage in the game. All that poke. So much poke here and so much damage. Yep, more than enough. So they're still rotating around here. Top side, that's where we're still having, uh, yeah, right wing holding the line a little bit. You can get some assistance from ETC again. They can make the same play over and over again. Just have the two globals sitting on the sides and push this lane out. But I really want to see what happens once the boss is back up. If the blue team, for example, decides that they're going to move in for it. And no matter what, since they have three nukes that they could use. Or how this is going to be played out here. So, yeah. That's essentially the main question. What they're going to do with that. I would love, honestly, to just see a mega YOLO move up at the top. Not sure if the teams are really going to try and do anything like that. But it's definitely possible. So... Mm, yeah. <laughs> That's level 20. Everybody is so timid right now. They know what's up. They know what's coming. They know it's going to be a top lane move there. And, yep, there's 20 for the red, for the blue team as well. So now we're getting rewind. That's a lot of claps, a lot of heals that he has. One clap after another. We're healing static following up. Boss is now up. Murden is already on it. So yeah, they have to decide whether or not they make the play there. The rest of the team is in the middle. They go for the Haka. I actually thought oh, they might go for it right away. But the Haka going down here, that's a big deal. That's a huge problem. Oh. Oh. Okay. Just checking, boss. That's an interesting scouting mechanic. Oh, <laughs> the light bomb hit. Nice. That was a big one. Here comes the nuke. And... Oh, Brightwing just got away from it. But Anduin is dead. Anduin is dead. Brightwing is also trying to escape. They're going for Diablo. Big Stormbolt. Brightwing with a save. Sylvanas jumps in. They're about to lose my F. And she hops out. Ah, Diablo with the wall is done. Blue team is about to fall here. Yep, Sylvanas is gone. Anduin, uh, he died early. Now we have my F also eliminated. And that is going to be game. They got close there. They got really close. Brightwing with some really cool escape moves too. Just before the new connected with the quick blink heal. So, yep, well done. But that's game. That's 100% game. Game number one. Oh, look, the blue team has another nuke again. <laughs> but, yeah. 10 kills to 11. Core is going to fall here 100%. This time they pull it off. Nicely done by Team Dequaza. So they take the lead in the best of five series. But a pretty entertaining one after all. So, yeah, well done. Best of five, first map, Warhead Junction goes to the red team. GG. Before we head into game number two, make sure that you subscribe to the channel if you haven't done it yet so you don't miss out on any future content here on Caldo TV. 
Game number two. Team De Quasa is in the lead. And now we're heading into Tomb of the Spider Queen, our second map. It was a bit of a wild first map, honestly. At the beginning, Gia's team taking a bit of an advantage, then heading into a boss fight that they basically... I don't want to say they've already won it, but they nearly took the boss and there was just a little bit left of them grabbing it. And I think ETC came out of the disc and stopped it, or Diablo pushed him, not quite sure who was first. But they were so close and at least getting the boss, and then they lost it, they lost the advantage, and it was an entire back and forth to try and figure out, okay, who's able to maybe make a play with the second boss, who maybe comes in, you know, wins the entire thing there. And at the end, it was a team fight in the middle that decided the game. But yeah, kudos to uh, Team Gia still for standing tall there. Again, them coming in as the underdog. On the other hand, Team Dequaza with the win now, playing here with Play as a sub today. White main gets banned, and as we're heading into game number two, it's kind of noteworthy again that A, this is best of five, and B, we are in the loser's match. The loser is out of the group stage, is out of the tournament. And let's not forget that also heroes can only be played a single time within a series, meaning that the 10 heroes that were played on the first map are now out as well, at least for this series. So kind of starting to limit the options a little bit, make sure that we have a bit more hero diversity and all of this. Uh, but yeah, right now we still have a chance for Team Gia to bring this one back. And I like their playstyle. A lot of the stuff that they're doing here is really fun and they're playing a bit aggressive. Now, in this group, probably one of the most entertaining teams so far has been Team Lopaka, with some really cool ones. But for now, we're gonna get, uh, yeah, Jojo banned out. I mean, it's still with the Spider Queen after all, right? So you're starting to ban a couple of the heroes that are really good at interrupting and at controlling space, like Junkrat. You're getting rid of Jojo, who's just amazing with interrupt potential on, uh, on the gems, and then also with uh, just like the wave clear that she brings in with Condemn and Zone Control. But we could still see... Uh, it's the second map, so there's still a lot of heroes that you can definitely pick to have some interrupts there. But also go into Chromie again, just to name another one, to be really annoying and well, there she is. Madara locks her in right away. The Prophet has spoken. Hogger for the Quasa. And yeah, Madara and Chromie. <laughs> like, there are certain heroes when you're in a draft, you're just like, blah, why me? Chromie is definitely one of them. Definitely one of the heroes where you're just like, ugh. So, yeah. To that note... Blaze and Rhaegar. Yeah. And Garrosh. Okay, so we get actually a very heavy front line for them. Garrosh from Okotzl. Blaze is in. I, the, the one thing that surprises me a bit that in all of these games that we've seen so far, round robins, best of threes in here, we haven't seen Zarya and Garrosh once. I don't expect it to pick every single game. Far from it. But I expected it to every now and then be picked. Maybe I'm blanking. Maybe we had it. And I forgot about it? But I don't think so. I don't think in Season 2 we saw it yet. And Zarya gets banned, so they're denying it even here, just as I'm talking about it. So... I thought maybe here's an opportunity to grab it, but nope, she gets banned out too. Yeah. It would've been kind of sweet to see that combo again. I like it. Just a space car, Garrosh, just running in and trying to, you know, get the perfect flip. Allow the team to get the kill. But what are we getting for damage? Gia could also pick Arrigan, by the way. He already got access to Mayev earlier. I mean, it didn't quite work for them, they lost. But he played also very nice games around Mediv, around Carrigan, and hasn't played as Carrigan in a bit. So there's a chance for him to pick her up once more if they attempt to add additional stuns here. So yeah, Carrigan is definitely an option for the map. But now also, the picks on the right side, so with the red team, now following up on their front line, we get Dekard Kane first, and as the main tank, it is a Numurak. So Numurak dive, Dekard Kane follow up, Chromie with the damage, and then they have Drak here coming in as their final pick, bit of an X-Factor style here too, but still looking at Gia, still curious what he is going to choose. Still, because again, Kerrigan would be a very aggressive version, stun, stun, stuns, but then they also need somebody that can really follow up on that. There's Kerrigan, and they follow up with Tychus. Okay, so Kerrigan is in the house. We're getting a lot of StarCraft action here, by the way. Blaze, Kerrigan, and Tychus, and that leaves the final choice for the red team, for Team Dequaza. They have the lead in this best of five series. Can they make that a 2 0 lead? We'll find out. But they need a little bit more oomph here. They could go for a melee hero. 
go for range. If they want more clear, then uh, again, a mage would be kind of nice, but that's also pretty susceptible to potential damage from Kerrigan. But they go Gul'dan, gonna horrify. So, stage is set. Two minutes Spider Queen, game number two between Dequaza and Gia. Game number two, Team Gia on the left side with Markotzel on Garrosh. We got Ritchu on Blaze. Xavalosh on Rega for the team, Skok on Tychus, and Gia is playing his infamous Kerrigan as they are trying to get some work done on this. So let's see how aggressive they can be with that. But right now on the right side, their opponents in the lead in this series with Dequaza on Hogger. We have Gamer Boy and Deckard Kane. Dark Reader, aka Drak here, is currently playing uh, Gul'dan. We got Mother on Chromie. So double mage plus Anubarak played by play. Double Mage is kind of wild, honestly. It's not something that gets played a lot. We had a couple of times in the days of HTC where teams were trying to make that work. Most of the time it didn't. But I still remember that Dignitas, at least in the final year, had in scrims one strategy that we have, they played with this. I don't actually think that they ever busted it out, so it was always a little bit on the niche side. You have to heavily play around cooldowns, which can make things difficult. But the advantage is that you have usually a lot of burst. So if you're executing it incredibly well, you can get really nice kills quickly. But you're also a bit out there once the play doesn't work and you're relying on your cooldowns again. So a couple of upsides, a couple of downsides. Definitely things have also changed since then, of course, with the game with a lot of the patches that we got in the meantime. And yeah, now we'll just have to figure out if they can make it work here. But with nice stuns and follow-ups, you can definitely blow a single target to Kingdom Come very quickly if they get the proper setup for it. So that's the big question mark here. Can they execute that? Can they pull that off? Yes, no, but time will tell. Obviously, it's also about the gems here, trying to collect it early on. Uh, that's where the wave, care com wave click comes in. Gul'dan is playing a nice role for them in, uh, in that context, at least. So that was already an important one for them to have. Double checking on the siege shines for just a second, and then see if they can maybe follow up a bit as well. But, and Chromie, obviously, specifically, it can be very, very annoying. Not only if you're having a proper stun setup that you can follow up on and then try and get a kill here, but also for interrupt potential, for granting them also a little bit of vision with the level 1 talent. You want to have as much information as you can. And the info that they're getting for now is that the blue team is making a play for the Siege Giants at the bottom, but they're a bit too late to rotate over and contest it. So, Siege Giants for Team Gia. And Gia's team... They are trying to fight back here. Their goal is, of course, to make this, make this entire series, to flip the series again on its head. They had an intense, absolutely intense match against Banana Age, and were so close to winning it. But on the final map, then, and it was a nail biter. They got defeated, so fi they find themselves in a losers match here. But this is really where you have to make the big plays if you want to have another chance to continue with the tournament. So. Can they pull it off? Yes, no. Time will tell. For now, they're definitely trying. We now have still no kill, but the camps that the teams have started to claim a bit of pressure against the walls, a bit of damage already done there. So they're slowly playing through that as everybody is just hoping to get first blood here, get a bit more control, turn the first few gems in. 37 against 33 right now that they hold in their hands. And specifically, Gia is going to play a big role here with the stuns. And there they are. The first ones are out. They go for Nubarak. They go for Deckard K. They kill both of them. And that's the blue team with a quick double kill in this game. And therefore, a very, very nice lead. Not only do they get two kills, but that allows them to turn in some of their gems. It allows for a bit of pressure that they have. And yeah, really opening up that game. So, pretty nicely done. Down at the bottom of the map, they're starting to chase the Quasar already. So, he's another one that they're trying to hunt down. Trying to fog out here. Yeah, and he gets away. <laughs> Garrosh was hoping he could grab him. But instead, he fell a little bit into that trap. Went too deep, got baited. And now he is gone. So there's the first counter kill, clearly indicating that Team Dequaza isn't done with this yet. So maybe an early setback to lose two of their heroes, but yeah, not really that big of a deal. Now they lost a couple of gems in the process, so that's a bigger problem, I assume. But Tigers now gets also killed. Okay, that dive potential that we're seeing from them is starting to come through. And that quick burst that they're getting with all of the ability damage coming from their two mages. 
32 gems are already delivered, but they are able to turn some gems in themselves. Can Drag here also deliver? Ah, uh, well, a little bit too scared after spotting Kerrigan then. And I'm definitely not gonna blame him for that. I would be scared too. Kerrigan with the combo attempt. Nice. Chromie. Ah, uh, not enough damage to uh, take Garrosh out, but definitely enough damage to throw him back in. Yeah. Kerrigan also didn't like that situation in the sliders. So, already a pretty nice back and forth between the two teams here. So, cool second map with our bot lane now. The one versus one that you would expect here. But Chromie gets caught and killed. <laughs> yeah, the train is hitting and it's hitting hard. Chia's already sitting at the side. Wants another one. Sees Deckard K. Gets the combo. It hits the noob rock. Deckard waddled away successfully. But yep, the noob gets murdered. At least a little bit. Didn't die. <laughs> but he fell fully into the comp. So yeah, it properly connected. But he's still alive and kicking. So three kills to two. And Enumerak went also full dive play. We have him now with the subterranean shield and with Under King. So they want to dive in deep to provide that stun that would allow Chromie and Gul'dan to follow up. And also Deckard Kane, obviously, for a bit of added CC that they're trying to do for here. Yeah, first turn in has now happened on the other hand, and with the initial advantage on gems, it's not a surprise that the blue team has grabbed it. So Team Gia has now on the objective a chance to take some of the structures out. Can they get that far though with it? Because already the fight is continuing at the bottom of the map. Everybody's starting to drop a bit low, but there's still plenty of hit points available. And you have, of course, the fountain close by. So none of the forts have been destroyed yet. So yeah, another opportunity right there. Can we take a fort out? I mean, that's always the best if you can. Go for a fort and try to take it apart. Already with ults in, that's a small lead in the experience, but that's more than enough if you have that little window that you can use to maybe force a fight and then get a kill. But even just trying to destroy the bottom fort would already be a win in my book. So, yeah. Play is starting to move in from the side. Webweaver is basically defeated. Chrome is still sitting in the middle, but they get their ults. So that gives us Shockwave, that gives us Cocoon, which gets used right away against Garrosh. And they got the Slowing Sands in this case. So Slowing Sands for Chromie. And of course, I mean again, Horrify for Gul'dan. Not gonna get a rain of RNG here, not anytime soon. So that doesn't really come as a big surprise or anything. But a ne well placed Horrify, honestly, whenever Kerrigan tries to make an approach, for example, could isolate her and then you can go for a quick kill there. So definitely something that they might try. Chromie gets killed again. And Kerrigan might pay the price for it. Wants to get the combo. Ah, but Gia dies. Gia dies. They had to bunker up. They also want to recover the gems, which they successfully did. And Nuburak still attempting to escape, but gets caught again. And he falls. And that is gems that they just can't reach. Poga <laughs> gets the kill against Tigers. <laughs> Not even close. Damn, that was a nice one. So yeah, grabs the kill right there. They're really at each other's throat, aren't they? Siege Shine still doing the damage down at the bottom of the, of the map, but boy, they're going all out on this. Kill for kill. The problem with all of this is essentially that with most of the kills that we've seen so far, it's honestly just the blue team that recovers most of their gems again. And Team Dequanza is having some real trouble as they're losing more and more of them. So it's getting a bit difficult for them to play around the objective here, which is, of course, never good when you're playing, I mean, on any Heroes of the Storm map. But I would say on two of the Spider Queen here in particular now. So level 7, we got Emerald, by the way. So we got the full shebang. Sapphire, Ruby, and Emerald have been picked up from Deckard Kane. Garrosh gets the Ancestral. Carrigan with a combo against Deckard Kane. Can't call all out on him, though. Really nice damage once again from the two mages here as they're trying to force them back successfully at that, at least for a moment. But it's all about turning in, and Drakia is holding 26 gem and has been holding them for a long time. Chromie gets attacked again, and Carrigan is just whacking away. Great ult from Deckard Kane to keep her safe. Slowing Sands now too, and Carrigan finds herself all of a sudden completely isolated, or at least slowed down, but they still get Hogger thanks to Garrosh and get the kill instead. So you gotta give them credit. The blue team is controlling these fights nicely. Even when they're having some trouble, they are able to recover. Garrosh making big plays for them. And Carrigan is applying tons of pressure also against specifically Chromie. Over and over again. They have a second set of Web Weavers. So another hit against the red team. And Team Dequaza is absolutely struggling. They haven't broken yet. But they're hurting. And they're hurting a lot.
They're also losing a lot of ground, specifically when we're talking about them losing gems. That's their ticket back into the game. And currently they're losing quite a few of those. So definitely a bit tricky. Bottom of the map now, getting attacked again, and this time the fort will fall. So fort gets destroyed. We have 13 talents now on both sides, and here comes the push for the middle and the top. As the blue team is trying to get a little bit more out of all of this. And yeah, they're doing good work here. Doing a lot of damage with this. And if they can now follow up with another kill, a Nubarak. <laughs> Timing down immediately. See Kerrigan, and immediately back. It's like, nah, 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 nah. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, we're having none of this. At least not right now. See you later, boys. Don't need any of this. Another nice shockwave, but the problem is that nobody is there to follow up with any damage. And uh, yeah, Garrosh helped out right away. And he's like, nah, boys, we're still fine. We're still good. This is all, all okay. So, yeah, what can they do from here on out? It's going to get a bit dicey. We have 55 gems in their hands. They have lost so many gems here, honestly. 43 gems still in the hands of the blue team. And yeah, it's pretty big. If you have this many gems and you deny it, come some to your opponent. Think about it, they already had two turn-ins. There's no, there's no way that the uh, red team gets two turn-ins at this point with the gems that they're holding. So yeah, nothing that they can really do with this. They get a one turn-in and a half, and that's about it. So that just gives you an idea of how much was already lost there still can fight back into it, but they have to get some kills, nice some gems to the opponent, and first of all, they have to get a turning completed. Look at Gia, he's just delivered another 20 gems here. Ruchu is trying for another 12. Yeah, good. They dodge out on some of the stuns, but the problem is still the same. They need to deliver. They haven't done any of that yet. So, yeah. Tough time. I mean, not quite sure. They're basically being pinned down here. And level 16 is going to come up soon here. So Tigers can now turn in some of his gems. They can control the bottom spot again. They try with Ruchu. They want to secure some of the plays. And they're getting closer and closer to the third turn in before the blue uh, before the red team is even ready for their own. So once again, uh, there's the kill against Garrosh. Finally, sign of life from Team Dequaza. They picked their moment and they chose it well. They take Garrosh out. Now they can get their turn in. They also closed the experience gap with it a bit. Yeah, for a second I actually thought that they would try to go for the boss here. But they, and they are! Alright, so they want to go for boss and do they allow the turn in? Okay, they get their own turn in and as long as Garrosh is gone they're going for the boss too. They want, so they want the double. They want both of them. Mm -hmm. And yep, let's go. Let's try and get the attack going here. Already we're having uh, 16 for the blue team. They're actually nipping around the edges here, sitting at the top, but Garrosh is just too late to really have an impact here. They can't slow this down, so Webweavers and Boss are actually very well timed too. So that this is really the moment. This is the play with which you come back. So right here, we now have six kills to five, level 16 on both sides. The Fell Flame build with the Rampant Hellfire now more or less completed. And Nuburak survives the initial fight, but especially the top lane is of course going to suffer. When you have boss and webweavers both, then this is going to hurt. And that focus, uh, focuses a lot of the resources of the blue team towards the top. So now a chance. Crystal is used. Carrigan definitely in some trouble. Trying to get out with the mobility. Gets stunned once, twice, and is gone. Carrigan is gone, and that's a big kill. Fort in the middle destroyed. Fort at the top destroyed. Fort at the bottom of the map. Likely going to get destroyed now. And they're hoping for, of course, a bit more damage here too. Boss is still taking out a tower at the top side. We have Tigers now with 26, 27,000 damage. Hogger with 28k. Chromium Gul'dan, identical damage, 24.7 thousand. But this was a big step back. They took three forts out. Their first objective eliminated three forts. So they have done more structural damage with one objective than Team Gia with two. That's huge. A lot of efficiency right there, and they got another turn in, and they're trying to work on it. So they're trying to, uh, to turn in once again here, and yeah, let's see how much they can do. If they can complete the turn in right now, that would allow them to maybe even push for the first keep of the game. So, yeah, nobody's contesting it, nobody's moving in, and bam, there it is. Red team with two turn ins in a row. So this is the, mo um, uh, bah, this is the moment where you can get the momentum in and really start to pressure them back even further. So, good move so far. But yeah, here's their chance. 
Already making a couple of plays for it now as they're moving in for the middle. There's still the camp that they have to defeat, so the opponent actually came in. I was like, alright, we still have one one camp, so this got quickly defeated. This allows the web weavers to push a little bit deeper. They don't have to contest with that, so that's already kind of nice. Now out all the way up at the top, web weavers still slowly starting to move in for this too, but this is the keep that they're going to try and take out because the wall got already severely damaged. Blaze and Carrigan are defending in the middle and the bot lane currently. And yep, here comes the next attack as they're trying to take that keep out. Adubara gets thrown, taunted. Where's the heals when you need it? He's alive! He's actually alive! And instead we're seeing Garrosh killed again, even though he got the Ancestral. So Garrosh is out. Carrigan, though, jumps in and takes the flea back apart. Hogga bites the dust, and this time Anubarak follows. Again, some gems lost. Good damage on the keep. The problem is they can't take it on. The, t the keep is still standing. They couldn't destroy the entire thing. A little bit of damage done in the middle. The wall is opened up here. Eight kills to seven, and it's... I mean, again, you had no idea who was taking this. No idea who's going to win it here. Both of the teams still have a shot at it and could theoretically make the big play there, but who is really going to be able to take that on? That's the big question right now. And yeah, time will tell. I mean, for now, we're still having some attacks happening around the uh, around the next turn that is coming in. So for, for now, it's the red team, uh, sorry, the blue team that is trying to push us out again. They had the gems there, they want level 20. If they have that window and can properly use it, they have a chance to maybe leverage the Storm Talons a bit more. And I guess it's going to result in at least one of the forts destroyed. Maybe even both of them are going to be eliminated. But yeah, we'll see. So there it is. That's already Farsia's blessing. We got the big red button, another huge play. Titanic Might. And still no level 20 for the red team. They would probably be well advised to jump back a bit here. The Quasar at the top is just moving out just slightly for a bit of damage. Shouldn't really overdo it. Losing a hero right now would definitely hurt way too much. Sacrificing a fort or two is still fine. The biggest thing is you don't want to lose too much now in regards to the rest here. So, yeah. But we'll see. We'll see what they actually are able to, or how much damage they are able to do. Because so far, the, the red team is not doing too badly. They're still defending kind of well here. It's nothing crazy, nothing insane, but still good enough to uh, make sure that they're not sacrificing anything down at the bottom of them. Specifically, of course, when we're talking about the keeps, you don't want to lose out of them. But yeah, what else? Another quick move being made, and one keep is apparently going to be lost. Yeah, this one is dropped low, and with Odin and Big Red Button being used, there's the chance. Ancestral, once again, a quick use from the old of Hogga for another stun. And Makotzel is in trouble, and he is just dying. Garrosh is getting farmed here. Every single fight. And they're losing more than Garrosh. They want to go for Tigers now, too. He's holding a lot of gems. They got Kane is dead, but the entire blue team is so low. Finally, Kerrigan get that Blaze, that Rhaegar, and they go for Tigers. Tigers is going to fall, too. They let him live? What? What? Who paid him? I mean, they want to go for the core and end the game, but why not kill him? Huh? He was right there. You just wait for the cooldown, you stun him. I mean, again, they're going for the core, they're going to win the game here. But I would have killed him anyways. No bloodlust for Anubarak, apparently. I mean, there it is. Anubarak is dead. He gets punished for uh, griefing. They're going to... They're not even end the game now. What the hell? <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> okay, who paid play? First he doesn't kill Tigers, which was a sure kill. And then he dies instantly at the core. And then not ending. Alright, it's a new strategy here, guys. I'm not familiar with this one. This is, this is new to me. I haven't seen this one in action yet. Uh, <laughs> we'll see how successful it is. And now the blue team is making a play. Trying to go for the boss at the top. <laughs> yeah, what am I watching here? Um, okay. 
it, it, it has, it had a huge advantage, by the way. That play had a big advantage. It surprised the hell out of everyone. They surprised the opponent, they surprised themselves, and they definitely surprised me. But now Team Gia, they stole the camp away from Team Gia, but the blue team now has a boss at the top. So that basically means the end of the top side forward. I don't think this is going to survive. But yeah, very interesting strategy. I have, I've, I've not seen this yet. This is a new one. Very curious. <laughs> they didn't see this coming. <laughs> it's like, yeah, neither did we. A bit more damage here in the fort, uh, the keep in the middle. Uh, the top fort is now gone. But yeah, <laughs> kind of wild. Okay, 10 kills to 11 now. Bottom keep is also destroyed, so yeah, bottom keep is gone. Skog is gonna have a good time here. Skog is a survivor. We have 60,000 damage, by the way, for Tychus. He's top damage in the game. Our two majors with 45,000 and 42,000. And Hogger with 41,000. So the three of them are essentially the backbone regarding damage for Team Dayquaza. And... yeah. Nine gems for a turn-in. That might end the game? And again, Quas at 83%, so it's already taking damage. But with all of those stuns, if you just fall victim to one good CC chain of Team Gia, then all of a sudden it's the blue team that takes it. So that call earlier, very, very out there. And I suppose it had to, I mean, again, it had to be the shot caller being like, hey, don't kill him, just come, we end the game now. But that was a miscalculation for sure. But in that case, can you really just do anything there? I mean, well, whatever. So, either way, whatever happened, I, I suppose it just misread it. They thought that they could take it down in that situation. Turned out, no. They thought that the kill against Tigers didn't matter. I thought it was okay. Again, he was right there. One stun, one engage, one burrow charge, and he's gone. Anyways, now we're ending up in an intense situation between the two. As, of course, Team Gia wants to tie in the series. Team Dequaza wants a 2-0 lead, which would give them a lot of safety. Make it very difficult. Reverse sweeps are super difficult to pull off and very, very rare. Blaze has to deal with the catapults at the top. At least they've taken the port out, so that's that. And yeah, down at the bottom of the map, we see a similar picture. There were Siege Giants too. Attack in the middle, and Nubra, Gul'dan, both dead. And ladies and gentlemen, seems like we might have a winner. They're getting close to a turn in themselves now. If they get another kill, yeah, they got Kano K still able to escape, but they lost two heroes now. And the blue team is going to try and enter the bot lane. Okay, so bot lane attempt to end the game. They still have Hogger, they got Kane and Chromie to try and stop them. Uh, and Hogger, does he get killed? Yeah, he gets out. Wasting their time. Wasting time. So that's not too bad. Ah, oh, okay, but they, they got Odin. Yeah, I actually thought they might have a cooldown. Okay, with big red button, yeah. I thought maybe they could buy enough time for somebody to come back, but there's Bunker on the ground now too. They really tried their best, but look how quickly the core disappears. Team Gia is gonna lock this one in. There's no, there's no way you stop them right now. Team Gia with a win. We have a tie as we're heading into game number three, everybody. Team Dayquaza losing Tomb of the Spider Queen. GG. Well, game number three. So, we have another tie. Once again, we're going to the third map, and Dayquaza is heading off against the Gia. Interesting games, let's put it like that. Very, very interesting games, and it is highly amusing. So, I want to see what's going on now. 20 heroes aren't available anymore. They've already been played, 10 in the first game, 10 in the second. Now we're heading into Battlefield of Eternity, where of course it's going to matter quite a bit which kind of damage dealer you're going to lock in against the Immortal. Now, I believe Greymane should still be up, right? Am I mistaken? Was he played on the first map? I don't think so. But Tracer gets banned right away, and we still have Vala available. We also still have, for example, Jimmy, if you want to go into Exterminator again, you could. Uh, <laughs> And white main, just white main just gets banned. They're just like, yeah, gamer boy, you're not gonna get white main. I was sorry, but yeah, she's uh, she's just out. So it's an amusing series, and I like the way that Team Gia is just fighting back time and time again into these things. So let's see how far they can go with this one now. But we get Lucio banned. 
And yeah, I'm actually a little bit curious what kind of like picks we're now going to get. If somebody is going for Valar, if it's going to like be an arrow build, uh, I, but you know what I actually miss, and I missed it for some time now. Uh, I want to see Thrall with Trash Lightning again. We had several Thralls in, uh, I believe it was the Round Robin, that were picked on Battlefield and were even part of the four man, and they still went into Trolling Thunder instead. But Trash Lightning is kind of amusing. And it's always a, not only stacking the damage up slowly and steadily, but also then whether or not you can complete it in time to have a real impact in the game would be pretty neat. Now we got Ural being banned out. Chen, okay. Gets also very quickly locked in. Play him as a main tank. Chen main tank on Battlefield of Eternity, Capybara style. Still a huge fan of that. That Korea tournament was amusing as hell. Played it so well there. So okay, we're now getting Li Ming. Obviously one of the best heroes that you can play right now on Battlefield of Eternity against the Immortal. The whole idea is that you just YOLO out your combos and then your opponent, you know, has to deal with that. Has to deal with the combo there in the sense that, yeah, they gotta figure out, okay, how are we gonna deal with this? Do we just let it go through against the Immortal? Do we instead just say like, yeah, well, whatever, uh, it's fine. Uh, the Immortal takes the damage, or do you just soak it up with some kind of hero and then you run the risk of being attacked and targeted destiny. and uh, taken out. But anyways, we now have Vala and we have Varian, so already seems like we're gonna get that arrow build that we've been talking about here. Varian together with Urel. It's actually a bit interesting because if you're playing with Varian, you obviously want to go taunt. I don't think that anybody would now go all of a sudden into a Varian meme blades build uh, just to complete a bounty here. It really seems like in a series this intense what's more likely going to happen is yeah that we're gonna get the normal playstyle for Varian him just trying to set things up but normally you want to have some burst damage behind it so they can uh, build all attack style would be a bit easier arrows then on the other hand if you're getting a taunt through and Vala gets for example a double arrow combo in with good stacks also pretty neat for her so but yeah Varian as a tank obviously pretty neat and Dequaz on Urel is just a monster so that's another one we got Ana banned out. Nobody wants to go up against the Nano boosted Li Ming. That's already tough enough as is. And here comes our next double pick. Alright. What are we going to get as a main tank from them? I mean, they know they're going up against Varian right now. So on the support side, you already are looking forward to someone that at least has cleanse or can zone that out. They go for Malfuri and they got Malganus. Okay, so you have to sleep against them too. So, a lot of tools to actually keep Varian at a distance. You got a Keg, Uther. Are we getting a second support? Nah, I don't think so. We have seen it before, though. We have even seen it on Battlefield of Eternity, a normal auto attack build for Vala. Uh, and then just, yeah, double support behind that. But, yeah, I don't really think we're going to get that here. With Arrow, you can do a whole lot. They go for Turanda. They have the double support. They could go auto attack now. So you have Turanda with Hunter's Mark against not only heroes, but also against the Immortals. So you have the extra damage there. Get the auto attack damage in. Varian can help out with that. So, uh, yep. That's definitely pretty neat. Again, we rarely, rarely see it on this map. But it has been played before. You can play it and just like try and focus on the team fights a little bit more. Typically... 90% of the games on Battlefield of Eternity, it's an arrow style for Vala as usual. But with the double support here, the auto attacks are of course way more likely now. So Junkrat gets picked, that's the final choice. Game number three coming up, Battlefield of Eternity, everybody, let's go. Game number three, Jion Liming for the blue team. We got Richu on Chen, Makotzel on Malganes, Junkrat on, played by Skook and Xavalosh on Malfurion. And there it is, Madara with auto attack. So they're shying away from using Monster Hunter, Arrow, Vala build in order to burn the Immortal down quickly. But instead what they're doing is trying to focus more on the team fights. You can of course still get nice damage out against the Immortal. But the priority has definitely shifted for the team with the double support pick that they now chose. We have Gamer Boy on Turanda that already helps you also with the Hunter's Mark. Not only against heroes that you're trying to take out, but also when we're talking about Immortal damage. And the stun can follow up on Varian's taunt that we're going to get on level 4. So you have Varian coming in with a taunt, Turanda with a stun follow up, then Uther played by Drak here with another stun, so a really nice chain that they can execute. And then on top of that you have Vala just completely murdering the target with auto attacks plus Dequaza. 
And the whole goal of playing that auto attack style is of course to try and keep, or the whole goal to play two supports with that auto attack style is that you're keeping Bala alive for as long as you possibly can because she goes Creed and Hunt of the Hunter on uh, level 1 and the Gambit quest here is kind of important. That auto attack speed is highly highly effective specifically after you get a level 16 talent and use Manticore. If you in the process also are able to get decent stacks on level 1, even better. So that 4 man is going to do a whole lot of work down here at the bottom of the map and it's all about Bala just starting to get some attacks in. Now, can they keep Bala alive? If she dies once or twice, it's honestly not that big of a deal as long as Madara at least gets himself some decent stacks. But this is a pretty cool way here. So they want to really focus a lot on what Bala can do as the game continues. The stun chain set, set uh, uh, targets up for her. And this is even going to get worse once that we are looking at not only more damage for Bala, but also more importantly, Taunt for Varian. And you could already see it there. I mean, imagine in that situation where Malganis is at the front, for example, if Taunt is already here. That's an immediate kill. So, yep, yeah, they're going to do their work. They're already going for the camp down at the bottom of the map. The more fights they have here, the better. Mala still <laughs> a little bit of an attack here against Skog, so they're keeping them at bay as they're going for the camp. It's obviously a 4 versus 3, which also means that the blue team is not going to look for fights. Equaza is playing against two and is losing already his wall at the top. That's why they're trying to do the same down here. And how did he end up on that side? Okay, Varian was a little bit over eager. I guess he bugged out and just like charged past the gate. But yep, with that, we're having now one kill for the blue team. <laughs> that's, a bit, that's a bit annoying there. Ah, Junkrat. Junkrat is. Okay, so my bad. Yeah, Junkrat must have uh, flipped him over. Yep. That makes a little bit more sense. I was just like, could he have charged over? He's like, yeah, he doesn't, doesn't have level 4 yet. There's no no taunt where it could be set up weirdly. So, yeah, either way. So, with that, we have one kill for the blue team. Nicely done. Bala is still on 35 stacks. And now they're trying to get a kill against Skog. And Junkrat is down. Nice. Gets punished for his misbehavior earlier against Varian. Top lane is now a 1 versus 1 down here. Yep, red team is starting to push for some structures. So after the Quasa, the top has suffered some damage at the hands of Team Gia. They are now able to repay them in kind at the bottom of the map as they're dropping the entire wall. And Valos is sitting at 40 stacks. Not insane, but pretty decent. So, yep, can definitely play around that. There's the taunt. Where are the stuns? Well, there they are. <laughs> Welcome to the problem. This is an issue that the blue team is going to have for quite some time now. Whenever a flank like this happens and you get a hit in against one of the squishies, they're essentially dead if the rest of the team is even close to nearby. Li Ming just disappeared. One moment she was there, next moment she was just gone. So now the halftime show is essential victory for Team Dequaza. And yes, <laughs> this is going to be the name of the game. Them trying to snipe heroes. Yeah, there's the taunt. A bit late. Gamer Boy not coming in with the stun. Drakia didn't have time to walk over, so the timing was definitely a bit off on there. And of course, forced the blue team to defend now. Some poke and attacks are still coming. Bala sitting at 54, so he has one done. Stun, stun, stun. Okay, two stuns are out. Rest gets a bit shut down. Uther still wants to make his way over. Gets another one in. And they have two heroes on the left side now trying to do damage as well. So it seems like it's still going to be an immortal for the red team. But a lot smaller shield than initially expected. So yeah, able to grab this. A little bit of damage still against Makotsu. Trying to move in. All right, setting up for Yorel. But Bala at 69 stacks. 69 stacks for her. And still working it out a bit more. The heal. And Fat Illidan jumps in and takes it down. And that same fate is there for Varian. So the front line is dead. And that means that this push at the top is short lived. This is not going to do a lot for them. Nope. Not really going to be able to do anything here. So three kills against two. Down to the bottom of the map now. We have Drakia still sitting tight. But yep, with the situation as is, yeah, it's going to be a little bit dicey, right? So uh, that push didn't really do anything for them. They win an objective, but you can't really push. Your opponent takes control, is able to also grab themselves a couple of mercenary camps. But they have, of course, Shen isolated now. So that's at least when the stun chain hits hard. And Shen is going to die here, isn't he? Yep, four attacks and goodbye. So Chen is gone.
That's the third kill for them. Three kills to three. You still have to deal with the top lane where the wall now got destroyed. But of course, attacks like this not only give you a kill, it also gives Vala stacks. And that's what they need to do. Get her a couple more stacks. Really prepare her for the late game. She's your hyper carry. She needs to be the one to absolutely crush things. And she is getting very good damage out against Makotzel. Nearly getting a kill here. He's still able to get away with the fell claws. But this is exactly the kind of moves that they need to pull off. And Madara is now in 93 stacks. So he's very close to completing his second quest okay. reward on level 1. So far hasn't died. Obviously with level 10 we have to re-evaluate re re things a little bit because there's a lot more isolation tools after level 10 that they could use. And yeah, we'll see. Also with level 7 we got Calderized Resistance. Still misspelled. They're still missing the age. Even like this, they, uh, honestly, typos, I don't understand why they haven't fixed that yet. I told them time and time again that my name is spelled with an age. So it's a bit of, it's really an oversight by them. And I feel that at this point it's intentional. I feel this is an intentional slide by them. But again, it is what it is. So yeah, a bit sad. Yeah, level 9 kicks in. Still waiting for rogue abilities here. Vala is currently sitting at the top and that's always the dangerous part when Vala is alone. Also, very aggressive move by Madara considering that he has nobody around him. So yeah, that's a bit of a thing. But yeah, the rest of the team has moved over, so they're starting to take the lead on this again. Yeah, Li Ming, a bit of damage from Calamity, but Jia also eating a lot of it. Oh, 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 they need the heals, and they need them now. Madara's at 98 stacks, and is about to hit his second press reward, so there it is. And I think they're shutting the servers down or something. What is happening here? A little bit of a, little bit of a mini lag fiesta. What is going on? Hello, team? Blizzard? Servers? Are we still okay? Are we still alive here? Well, the attacks are coming, and they're going for the objective again. Vala by now with two quest rewards, so there's 2% of extra damage that she has on the attacks. Still mostly caring about the objective. We want to look in the halftime show very quickly. Li Ming moving in, they're getting pushed back out, and next attack is already coming. And I swear to God, they're shutting the servers down on me. What? So, yeah. Level 10 for both teams, any moment, so it's getting close. And they're locking him in right away, and that gives us the top shelf play for Chen, obviously. Also, Divine Shield, they got a panic button for Vala whenever she's going to be in trouble. So, uh, stacks also on 14 now for Taranda on a level 1. URL had go to go to the top and tap the fountain here, whereas the rest of the team is still trying to just defend the Immortal here. So it's getting really intense here. Because Vala has so far been playing this exceptionally well. And again, Madara is also playing cross-server. So he's playing from North America on the European server for this tournament. And he's doing a fantastic job. There's a lot that hinges on him. A lot of responsibility on his shoulders. And he's so far dealing exceptionally well with it. Good damage, good auto attack. He's currently sitting at 20,000. The only Junkrat has more than him. But as he continues towards level 16, this is where the real party then starts. But Vala is moving in once more. Attack after attack. Turning Melganis into a pincushion. And still working the objective at the same time. As the team is getting chased, the Quasa is just dodging grenades over here. Play. Oh, he gets out. Okay, so play doesn't get attacked or killed either. They only lose to Randa. But a lot of damage done to the Immortal. And this would be a big shield if they could get that thing done. But of course, now with the numbers advantage, there's a chance for the blue team to finally move over and do damage themselves. And again, yeah, Draki gets attacked again. Chen eats the damage. Madara just leaving the auto attacks and getting a lot done here. He's nearly at three now. Keg play is out, dodges away. Variant dies. Vala still fine. They're still losing heroes here though, but Chen might become the next target. Uther is dead. Dequaza realizes he can't get the kill. Vala at 145 stacks and they just cannot get that immortal, can they now? It's so damn low. They're now trying to move in to deliver the final few blows, but it's going to be a tight race here. Dequaza comes in, Madara as well, and the red team gets immortal number two. Madara now with 147 stacks and he still has not died yet. But the immortal, I mean, it comes at a price, right? They get it, six kills to three in favor of Team Gia. Ooh, but still, is that going to be doing enough damage? Mala's now at the top, so they're trying to attack on two sides at the same time. Immortal has to be defended against down at the bottom of the map, but they still have a chance at the top. Top take plays, taunt, stun, stun, stun. 
<laughs> I kind of feel sorry for Jen a little bit. Rain and vengeance and all the stuns in this world are coming in. And they're just taking them down. That's kind of crazy. So, uh, yeah. Either way, that's 30,000 damage nearly for Vala. She's still no top damage. It's still Junkrat. But she is stacking like crazy. And it's glorious to see Madara just like work it here. So they are going to get that fort at the top as well. They already destroyed the one at the bottom of the map. And yeah, here we go. Forts are destroyed and they have a lot of wiggle room now. It's all about scaling into the late game. It's really all that this is about. Scale into the late game, make your play with that. And up to now, it is going according to plan. They're losing a couple of heroes, which is totally fine. Vala is scaling. They're prepping for later on. As long as they don't lose her, it's kind of okay. But they're losing Uralnard on at the bottom of the map. Clay is still making it out. That's an early level 13. You're waiting for 16. You're waiting for 20. Path like Quiver obviously giving her even more space. Even more safety. But for now, it's all about Gloom. Getting Gloom in here to ensure that she can dodge out on some of the damage from Junkrat and Liming. But the pressure is now on. Kind of missing this a little bit. Divine Shield is up and he uses it right away. So there's another taunt. Good damage. And... <laughs> Melganis with his own ult. Dodging out on this. Another quick attack coming from Varian, but he doesn't have the cooldown ready for Taunt. So they can't use that. But either way, off we go. A few more attacks are coming in from Vala. She's at 171 now. Yeah, looking very good here. 171 stacks and getting close to the next quest reward. So they want two objectives. They still have all of their forts, which means that they are fountains towards the middle of the map. And now an opportunity to not only take their camp, but then also go for the next objective. And again, with every single, every single level that they're getting closer to 16, they're getting into a better spot here. 116 is ready, and she has still all of her attack speed, and then the extra damage that comes through the quest. Chen is gonna have trouble. Melganus is gonna have trouble. The front line is going to hate every moment. And even if she dies once, I mean, who cares? 5%, you can definitely sacrifice that. So Madara, very, I mean, big respect. And the blue team knows that too. And they need to win an objective finally. This is one of their few chances. Oh, but yeah, that's what I said about early being isolated. And he dodges out on everything. What the hell? Madara is just juking them. Juke city. And now the camp at the top has to be dealt with. But yeah, the way that Madara is just absolutely negating the barrel, even though he was isolated from the team, is massive. Now they're getting big stuns out and damage in. Look how, look how McGannis just gets ping-ponged around. He survives it, but he is so low. They got to retreat. They can't do anything about that. So more stuns are coming in, and they just did a perfect job there, forcing Malganus back. They couldn't get the kill, but they even got the value out regardless. Turanda, <laughs> Gamer boy got hit here. Hope that we did. <laughs> he got hit like three times. <laughs> like what? <laughs> oh god. Yeah, this is the moment when you're just sitting there and you're like, I hope nobody saw that. We saw. We did. But yeah, it's okay. It's okay. You're, you're still fine. You're still doing well. But now we have a level 15. One level until 16. One level until Manticore. And everybody on the front line of the blue team is already dreading that moment when it happens. So, yep. There it is. So at this point, here comes the next attack. They're coming in with Malganis. Makotzl is just eating damage. The entire game, he's eating damage over and over again. Varian, on the other hand, is eating more. But, yeah. Arrow is... Oh, oh, careful. Yeah, displacement, all right. They're trying to go for Varian. Chen comes in with a keg to isolate him more. And Varian goes down. Nicely done. Junkrat first, and then they're using the keg to isolate the target further. But Malganis gets killed as a result, which means that both of the teams have now lost their main tank. Yeah, nice move again from Liming, but is it going to be enough? That's the question. They try to defend here. Dequaza, careful. Has no ult. Needs to be mega careful with this. Vala moving in again for a few more attacks. She's at 45,000 damage right now. Divine Shield to save the day for Uther. 200 stacks for Vala. And look how close they are to level 16. They're so close now to 16 here. They're trying to go for the Immortal. They might be able to win this one. I'm not sure yet. Yeah, more damage against Junkrat. Oh, the stun from Duran. They're connecting as well. They got them in the choke point now. Madara ace too far out. That was... Yeah. 
I mean, he's making some very aggressive plays, and I think he probably thought that Barrel was still on uh, cooldown, but that's the first death now on Vala, and I think it was unnecessary. He could have either gone for their own Immortal, or Vala could have stayed back a little bit further, but moving into the choke point like this and giving Chen just that immediate kill opportunity was a bit too far. So 16 versus 16, again, one death is fine. They have Manticore, 20% additional attack speed still, thanks to the level 1, so that's neat. But yeah, that, that death was kind of avoidable. Had a couple of dicey moments already earlier, and I think Chen was pretty happy because he was like, okay, finally got my kill. Finally, I got my kill there. Um, but, yeah. Okay, so, all the way up at the top. Let's see what we can set up for the blue team now. Because that's their moment to come back. I mean, Team Gia has an opportunity right now. Once again, we get the cake plays. Vala gets isolated into a corner again. But this time, she has a little bit more help, I suppose. They're moving past her. Where's the Divine Shield when you need it? There it is. So, yeah. He's paying attention for that. But that Immortal is definitely hitting a lot harder. The board is already lost and still playing around there, too. So now the next attack is coming in as they're starting to make the next... Yeah, Immortal is going to get destroyed. Gia pausing the game, though. I'm not quite sure if they lost anybody there, but it seems like nobody at least disconnected. So either way, 10 kills to 5 puts them into a really good spot when it comes to team fights. But now that level 16 is ready, I'm curious how the next ones are going to shape up because Vala's damage is now going to be heavily increased from that talent. She's at 50,000 damage already. Li Ming and Junkwood are still ahead of her, so she's third highest damage in the game right now. And then, of course, with level 20, if he gets to that point, we're going to also have her with Farfly Quiver. Very, I mean, could go into a couple of other talents, but I suppose Farfly Quiver is fairly realistic, giving her a bit more safety and a bit more distance that they can use there. Now, in addition to that, when we're talking damage, Vala is obviously in that spot where it's ha their main damage dealer. And if you're looking at the numbers over on the other side, Chen is 30,000. You have both Li Ming and Junkrat with really nice output. Nobody else even comes close to any of that on the side of Team Dayquaza. Urel is the closest with 26k, so she's kind of mirroring Chen, I suppose, a little bit. But yeah, they're missing out on some. So they are fully reliant on Vala getting that single target damage out, and Manticore is a big step into the right direction for them here. But you can also tell that it's tough for them to deal with the opponent's support. We have Malfurion with zero deaths so far, and... On top of that, when you're thinking about it, even with the double support, the red team already lost 10 heroes. So they have two supports here, which gives them a lot of sustain in these fights, but they lost a lot of ground with this. Now, the good news, of course, is there is still a fort down at the bottom of the map. One of the traditional plays that you oftentimes see with the blue team now moving down here, just like starting to move down to the bottom of the map and trying to get the second fort destroyed as the immortal is still being defended at the top, breaking through the gate. Now, we also have Lunar Blaze nearly completed. So, we have a little bit more damage that is now coming in from her too. On level 16, we got the Celestial Attunement now. And we have Uther with Benediction. That in and of itself is already big. Benediction is just a powerful talent. So, yeah, if you're going full Piano Uther here, hit, hit all the buttons and Benediction is a really, really big tool in uh, your belt. And as expected, they rotate it down. They're trying to do some damage here. Vala's now on her way. But I want to see how she... Uh, I want to see how the front line now fares against her. If we're having these fights play out like they did previously. <laughs> Madara went a bit deep there, no? I mean, sometimes he's really just baiting them. There's no Divine Shield on Uther, and he literally ran into five. So there's again Chen trying to isolate her. Maybe a little bit over eager. Not quite able to pull that off. Stuns are out. Vala, okay, gets her own stun in. And they kill Junkrat. Junkrat is gone and Vala comes in. And you could literally see the Manticore hit and now they're just melting them. Yep, there's the problem. Right there in front of you. Stun and gone. Three heroes eliminated within a span of 10 seconds at most. So they just went into the fight. Vala started to kill everybody. They stunned them up for her, and now they're going for the keep. <laughs> Just like that. This is exactly why, what you're trying to accomplish with that particular build. So yeah, two heroes are alive, and that is... Damn, Li Ming got kicked across the map. And all of a sudden, we're talking core. All of a sudden, we're talking core. Three heroes down, they go further, they go deeper, they go for Li Ming, they take her down too. Malfurion, that old geezer, is the only survivor here. Just like, oh, I'm gonna stop you. 
Where's my footing? And well, it goes down. That's game. Team De Quaza. They are locking in a victory here. So yeah, nicely done. They flipped the switch completely on the opponent's team. Junkrat, he came, he saw, he died. Many VD, BG. And that is a 2-1 lead for Team De Quaza. An insanely quick twist on Battlefield of Eternity as they lock in the victory. Game number four, let's go, Cursed Hollow. The fourth map, 30 heroes unavailable because they have been played already. Yeah, and now the big question, obviously, can De Quaza and his team take the victory and continue to the next round of the group stage or not? Or are we going to a fifth map? Now, quick reminder, if Gia and the blue team, if they lose right now, it means that they are out of the tournament. They are gone. They would be the first team to be eliminated from the tournament. Everybody else still has a chance to make it out of the group stage and enter the finals. I, I love, by the way, the respect ban against Gamer Boy. Yeah, I mean, continuously just white main getting banned, 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 banned. <laughs> she has absolutely no chance to ever see any playtime in this series. Each and every single map has started the same way. White main? Nope. No, thank you. So, she gets eliminated. She's already out. We got Sergeant Hammer banned. And with Cursed Hollow, again, Tyrael could be an option for them. Make some sanctification plays around the bosses. Go to Judgment. The one Tyrael game that we had in this group stage so far was actually a Judgment game. So that's another one. And here comes Jojo. So, so Johanna is out as well. I actually think that even if we're going to a fifth map, Johanna is not going to see any play anymore. As we're starting to whittle down some of those pools, she becomes more and more of a big play uh, and a big hero. So uh, teams are going to ban her out to deny them to the opponent because she just becomes such an attractive first pick currently. We get Tyrael as our first pick instead though, and that's exactly what I spoke about earlier. So either we're now going to get them with Judgment, depends a little bit on what they're picking. In uh, the other game that we got, it was Karazim coming in with a seven-sided strike and then really trying for blow-up potential. And... Yeah. Next double pick for the red team. So, what are we getting? How are they going to try and play into this now? The strategy on the last one worked quite nicely. False that. Okay, so they got the global, they got Gust. Can use it around bosses, can use it around tributes, can isolate. Could play it also. I mean, if you really wanted to, you could still play Stitches and go for an isolation play with a Cook Gorge into False that Gust. Medivh is, by the way, also still up. If that would fit for Team Gia, for example. He's been playing it before. We have Stukov, so that's always nice. Any kind of stun that you can follow up with a quick one there is always pretty neat. Rayman and Sonya. You know what would be the most amazing thing right now if Team Gia would all of a sudden pick Morales? They got Greymane, they got Tyria. They already have two out of them. They're missing out on Falstad, which would have been nice, but a traditional build or a traditional playstyle with Morales would be exactly that. They're banning out Karazim, and Karazim got banned for exactly the reason that I pointed out earlier, because we saw Tyrael Judgment with Karazim already, so they're not trying, they're trying to deny them any kind of blow up potential like that. That's the reason why Karazim gets banned. Now they're going to pick Morales and they're going for a backdoor strategy. Just you wait. <laughs> Just you wait. So, Karazim is banned out. Final ban for the red team, and they're getting rid of the Vikings. Yeah, smart. I can see that. Not sure if they would have really picked it, but it's definitely a, a threat and a big one. The wait is over. Cassia and Imperius. I guess we're not going to get stitches after all, unless they're swapping it over to uh, um, to De Quasa. Imperius could still be played as a side laner here, of course. All right, double pick for the blue team. So. What we what are we getting here for them? They still need damage and they still need the support. Anna and Jaina. Nano boosted Jaina damage. Alright. I can get behind this. Even with sanctification here, if you get the burst damage for Jaina, I mean that's a big one. You get the bullet with Greyman and Jaina comes in and just BAM! Burns the target down mega quickly and it brings us to Dequaza, the final final pick 
for this best of... Uh, sorry, not for the best of five, not necessarily, but for this map at least, for this fourth map. And it's Illidan. <laughs> they go Illidan. All right, is Hunt coming in? Are we actually going to get a bounty attempt now too? Cursed Hollow, everybody. Let's go. We have Team Dequaza going up against Team GL. Game number four. First match point for Team Dequaza. And I don't know why, but it just makes me happy to see Dequaza on Illidan. <laughs> it's going to be glorious, no matter the outcome. We have on the blue team side, Richu with Sonia. We get Makotzel on Teriel for Team Gia. We have Xavalosh on Greymane. Uh, sorry, Xavalosh on Ana. Gia on Greymane. And Skok is playing Jaina. On the right side, Dequaza, as mentioned before, playing Illidan. We've got Gamerboy on Stukov. Malara with Thunderstroke going for the stacks on Cassia. We have play on Imperius as a main tank and Drakir on Falstad. Yeah, Imperius main tank can definitely work, but he's also sometimes a bit more on the squishy side. And now that it seems like we're going to get once again Tyrael with some aggression, even though this time we got Justice for All as the level 4 choice. So he could definitely go into Sanctification also here with Greymane and with Sonya, both of them just moving easily forward and try and take some of these fights. But I, I, I like the way that this one is uh, the way what this one is already playing out. So the Quasar's team at this point, they are starting to uh, play it out with Illidan, who likely is going to go into hunt and then could complete another bounty there. I'm actually not 100% certain if they already completed that bounty or not, to be absolutely honest with you, but I think they are still missing out on it. So yeah, just as a quick reminder, you can't complete this, the same bounty twice for a team. So, uh, yeah, if you have that one thing, you know, that works for you, you can't just, like, lock that in over and over and over again, and uh, that's just simply what happens here. But, yeah, either way, we now have the uh, push at the top with the three-man down at the bottom of the map. Illidan is already ready and starting to make his move for uh, the easy stacks that he's going to get there, trying to stay away from Jaina, at least initially, as much as he can. So he's letting her out, push out the lane, and then he just picks all of that up. You want to complete, of course, your quest as quickly as you can, get that extra single target damage in, and then work towards continuing throughout the game and just scale into the late game. And there's a lot of heroes that they can now use that really scale well. When you're talking about Illidan, we're talking about Cassia, so there's quite a bit going on there if it's going to end up being one of those extended games. The Quasa, they're already, they're already trying to gank up on him. They're already trying to make some moves at the bottom of the map, and he's having absolutely none of it. Without vision, he's just sitting there like, yeah, that ain't happening. But they know that Illidan cannot really attack into this by himself, so they burst the tower down within moments, within seconds, and they get it quickly. And up at the top, we still have Richu doing his thing as well, making a couple of moves here. Middle of the map, we now have the next uh, team coming in here. Yeah, with Makotso starting to play around. Maybe a little bit too far out at the front, but they can't really punish him for that. They have some stuns, they have some isolation tools, but it's really all about how Imperius acts with his lunge and then the follow-up from Stukov, who barely gets out of that fight, by the way, before he gets eliminated. So, yeah. With that, we're now looking at five stacks also for Illidan, and he's already working on the camp. Fallstead sitting at the side, Drakia, he's going to try and get some of these gusts with the perfect angle. And yeah, Illidan is starting to do his thing over on the right with the first camp. So, all good in the early game, but Illidan in particular needs to scale. You can't just simply pick Illidan and, you know, just early on expect him to absolutely crush everything. So it's really just about him being able to get into the late game, create a little bit of space for him, ideally take some of the forts out so that the distance of safety or three safety for the opponent is really high so he can chase and have some time to work with it and then stay away from stuns. And there aren't really a whole lot of stuns for Team Gia. That's honestly a problem against Illidan. It's a massive problem. They have a few tools that they can potentially use, but when you're talking about real hard stuns, there's not a lot. You can get a sleep through, you got, got a couple of slows, you got also some damage, so if you're able to burst them down, great. But generally speaking, you want stuns against them. And they don't have a lot here. So that is a huge issue, at least in the late game. So if it comes to an even late game play, then Illidan can very easily be the linchpin in this. Now right now we have not a single kill yet, but walls are already getting destroyed. Illidan is still roaming between lanes a bit in an attempt to also get more of his decks together. And they're even grabbing the first tribute with ease. So Team Dequaza is setting things up pretty nicely for themselves here. Yeah. Illidan himself now with Unbound on level 7. Uh, Sonya is going for a spin win build. 
with life funnel on level 7 and hurricane and it seems more and more likely from the build that we're getting here that it's all about empowering Raymin from uh, TRL. You really want to have him with sanctification here. But the attack is coming. There's the first stun. Illidan is jumping in and they get the kill on Jaina. And here's that distance to safety problem. They're chasing, 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 chasing and they're getting Raymin too. And now the rest of the team is getting exposed and that means that Ana will fall. Tyriel survives through it. Only... Well, Tyriel is still alive. Anna is down, Tyriel and Sonya, the two survivors here, as three heroes are down, and Team Dequaza with some solid, really solid damage, and the ability to take down the bottom fort. So the bottom fort, easily destroyed, nicely done, and... Yeah, three kills to zero, half level lead, get the first fort destroyed. This is the start into the fourth map. I mean, yeah, perfect, absolutely perfect. So exactly the kind of place that they needed to make there can also like start to work around bosses a little bit because that's what the blue team is currently doing. They're coming in here to try and take this one quickly. And they did a lot. So, yep. Get sniffed out by Illidan though. And they'll try... Guys, level 10 is there any moment. This is gonna be a disaster. Gia, what are you boys doing? Paulson is gonna get level 10 and fly in. What are you doing? This is backfiring so hard. They're going for the kill, they're going for Sonia, and well, Sonia is dead and the boss is stolen and they have level 10. <laughs> no! <laughs> it's an utter disaster. What a shit show. Five kills to zero. <laughs> And now it's a boss and Rayman at the top is at least getting the tribute. So Gia is getting a tribute for the team, but damn. Oh, five kills to zero. Illidan is nearly done with the quest. They're already working the entire wall down before the boss is even here. Catapult is coming in too. It's disastrous. They're gonna lose the key here. <laughs> we are six and a half minutes in and they're losing their key. What? They're picking up level 10 just in time for defense, so I don't think that they're going to try and go for core here. This is going to be, with the death timers being this low, that would be really asking for trouble. Unless, of course, they're now getting the kills. Hunt is out, Sanctification is being used, so they have at least an attempt to get also a bounty. They could get a bounty, I don't think they completed this one yet. There's at least a kill against Imperius, and the quest is done for Jaina. The core is not losing any hit points, but yeah, that is just disastrous. If seven minutes in one of your keeps is already destroyed, you know that you're in trouble. Now, there is a second tribute that they're probably going to be able to pick up because Imperius is dead for another 10 and it's not going to be there in time. I don't think they can interrupt from this position. But Illidan is now at 40 damage on auto attacks thanks to the completed quest. They have 13 stacks for Cassia, which is not really good. Cassia is very, very low in stacks, but this is not necessarily Madara's fault considering how the game has been going. There wasn't really a lot of opportunities to stack. Either the blue team just disappeared or, yeah, that's kind of it. So, uh, as this continues, we're now having uh, down at the bottom of the map a couple more camps being taken all the way to the top right. We see the same picture. So, yeah, camps are getting attacked and taken time and time again. But it's really for me personally now about how they can play through the next couple of team fights because Illidan is going to become more and more of a menace as this continues. And if they're now giving the boss up at the top, this means another fort is likely going to get destroyed. There's a level of 30 talent advantage with virulent reaction coming in. We're getting War Traveler. Falsehood obviously still has a gust. Even if they would come in at this point, it would already be too late. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's bad. It's pretty bad for Team Gia. One kill is all they got thus far, and that was on the defense earlier when Imperius stayed back and sacrificed himself there. So now they're going for the Siege Giants at the top and work those out. Defense is obviously going strong, but we have even... Even now, we have the bot lane pushed by Siege Giants and Catapults. We're not gonna do any big damage for a while now, because essentially it's too early in the game. But Ana gets killed, blue team is cursed, Illidan is already jumping in, nothing can really damage him. And yeah, they gotta deal with this first, they gotta deal with <laughs> the I mean, oh my god. <laughs> the Quasas team is going through them like hot butter through cheese. I mean, they really are. They're just melting everything away. Being it heroes, being it structures, it doesn't even matter. And now with the curses, look at this. Guys, we're nine minutes into this game and the second keep is gonna fall. 
The top four has been destroyed by the boss, which is now marching for the last keep. This is insane. This is ridiculous. This is absolutely ridiculous. We are not even 10 minutes into this game yet. Look at the top lane. Curse is still going strong for another 18 seconds. They're trying to defend over here. They're desperately trying to get themselves a few kills. And I suppose they might get the kill against at least Imperius. So yes, he's down. Illidan comes in. Wants to get a kill against Greymane. Says hello and chunks him down. Ford in the middle is going to fall. Boss is busy at the keep at the top. Now Jaina is dead. They're just murdering them. Cassia gets finally killed here, but Illidan is now at 52 stacks on his level 1, and this is the final structure getting destroyed. We're 10 minutes in! Literally 10 minutes! <laughs> what the hell? This is, this is nuts. I have seen bots survive longer than this. Team Gia, I really don't want to take anything away from them. They have done a fantastic job throughout the group stage. They surprised me a lot against Banana Age. It was an incredible series. An absolutely incredible series. And they did well in a lot of the games against them in Team Dequaza too, but it just feels like they ran out of steam here. It's really what it feels like. It feels like they just ran out of steam. So now we're 11 minutes in. And, yeah, it's 52 stacks on Illidan's level 1, 11 stacks on his level 4, uh, sorry, his level 7. And, yeah, Team Gia is running around like a couple of headless chickens, just desperately trying to set up a party bush. They basically, I mean, they need the opponent to screw up, and they're just going for the core. So they're trying to get the boss here. At the same time, the core is getting exposed. The first of them are already hearthing back. Rayman is staying back a little bit longer. But they're saying just, they're just going for core. They're just going for the core. And letting Illidan sit on the core is the worst thing that you could possibly do. I mean, again, kudos to Team Dequaza. They lock in a 3-1 victory against Team Gia. Team Gia is eliminated from the tournament. It's sad, but it is what it is. GG. Well played. Thank you everybody for watching the video today. I hope that you enjoyed the show and the commentary. And keep in mind that the spoiler protection that is going to run for the rest of the video is made possible by all the support on Patreon.com. So guys, if you want to support my work, if you want to help me start new projects and keep the spoiler protection in place, please consider heading over to Patreon.com slash Kaldor. There's also a link in the YouTube description and check that out. Thanks in advance and see you guys next time with more esports coverage here on Color TV. Have a great day.